So thank you. Please welcome Sacramento City Mayor Daryl Steinberg. I think that was the state of the city speech right there. <laughs> Thank you, Shira, for your very kind introduction and your leadership in elevating the creative economy. So grateful for what you have created at the atrium and your outspoken support for insisting that arts and culture become a lead priority for our city. And also, congratulations on becoming an American citizen yesterday. It's a big deal. Thank you to Faith for curating today's performances. Thank you to our amazing National Youth Poet Laureate, Alexandra Huynh. That was really, really something. And today's MC, Ulania Smith, one of our thousand strong high school interns. Thank you to all my council colleagues who I will speak about more in the next few minutes. Our city manager, Howard Chan, and his incredible team. I could not ask for a better partner or city manager in the city. Thank you to all of the dedicated city staff. A special gratitude again to our public safety first responders, our firefighters and police officers. I wanna thank my own team. I am so blessed to work with the people that I work with and could not do any of it without you. I wanna thank all of the people who work on the fifth floor at City Hall for giving their all to the public service. I wanna thank all of the other public officials who are here today who have joined us. And I believe former Mayor Heather Fargo is in the audience. Let's welcome Mayor Fargo. Thank you to my wife of 30 years, Julie Steinberg, for being here today. Longer than my mayoral term, by the way. Most of all, thank you to the people of Sacramento who have given me the chance to serve you for 25 years and still going. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, that's worthy of a short applause. Thank you all for coming this morning. I wanna start by taking a moment to remember the nearly 1,800 lives lost due to COVID in our county and the suffering of all those by those who love them. All of those lost were spouses, they were partners, they were children, they were grandparents, they were siblings, loved ones all. Let's take a moment of silence, please, to honor them. Thank you. How do you write a speech after a once in a century pandemic that so dramatically changed our lives? Do you choose stories of inspiration and overcoming or do you focus on the immensity of the loss and the hardship? Do you talk about all the problems or do you set all the hard stuff aside and just celebrate the fact that we are together once again. Do you speak about all that we have in common or the real divides in our communal life? Of course, I know the answer. If we are going to be real, we have to talk about it all. Just like the experience of our own lives, the state of our city is complicated. We are at once growing we are thriving, we are a destination for others, we are joyous, and we are together. We are also hurting, we are imperfect, 
and we are sometimes divided. Why should the experience of a city be any different than the human experience itself? The last year has been hard on everyone, and most of all for those who have suffered real loss. But our city has also persevered, and that's why we, were able, we are able to gather here today at one of the shining examples of Sacramento's future. Look around you. This beautiful convention center, next door to this new performing arts center, bounded by this new community space, defines the possibilities for our city center. Even in the worst times of the pandemic, even as so many businesses and workers and people suffered, the work on these vital projects never stopped. So many ways throughout time it has been said, and it is so true. We can't always know what great challenge is coming our way, but we get to decide how to respond. We can choose whether to cower and complain, or we can choose to care for one another, to fight through, and to help make it better. We made the second choice. We always do in this city. While this year has been unique, in many ways, it has only elevated who we have always been. For Sacramento is one brave city. Bravery is more than visible acts of courage. Bravery is demonstrated every day when people quietly do their best, show kindness when no one else is looking push beyond their comfort zones without fear, reinvent themselves, and do what's right, even when the outcome is uncertain. This building, these two buildings, are big visible, visible signs of rebirth, with conventions scheduled well into 2030, including the Unified Wine and Grape Symposium for 10 years, Mike Testa. So is the $400 million courthouse under construction in the rail yards and the many cranes, and you see them everywhere, hovering over new office, hotel, and apartment buildings rising in downtown, midtown, and throughout the city. Even more momentous are the brave investments in Sacramento that people have been making these last months, confident that their community will support them as we reopen. Just a few blocks from here, on K Street, two friends are living their dream of bringing Nashville hot chicken to Sacramento. <laughs> Cecil Rhodes and Jake Bombard opened Nash and Proper in the middle of the pandemic. And even though most people are still working from home, there's often a line out the door. Thank you, Cecil and Jake. And Gabby Martin and Soledad Mendez also took a leap of faith when the pandemic cost them their jobs in the beauty industry. They used the technical assistance they received from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as part of the city's COVID relief effort to strike out on their own. Three days ago, they cut the ribbon for their new Gabello Salon on Merchant Street in downtown Thank you for living your dream. And as Shira mentioned a moment ago, Tamira Sandifer, or Ms. T, took the opportunity to change and grow her business into a remarkable online enterprise that now reaches nearly 200,000 students and teaches them not just how to dance, but how to produce podcasts and videos and be entrepreneurs. Ms. T says simply, her mission is to alleviate poverty in communities of color. Bravo to you, Ms. T. And two guys from South Sacramento, Dennis Sidnor and Erica Vila, launched their own mobile kitchen when they lost their jobs as line cooks due to COVID. They have joined a network of 10 black chefs 
who prepare food at events around Sacramento every weekend and are doing great business. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Alicia McHale, a mom of two who is also here with us today, was one of those who learned new digital skills through a city-funded retraining program sponsored by the Greater Sacramento Economic Council and the Urban League. She now has a new job with Zenify, a Sacramento software company, and makes more money than she ever has in her entire life. There are thousands of these kinds of stories in our city. Stories of holding on, of starting over, and of people struggling themselves, but helping others having even tougher times. Thank you to the Downtown Partnership and Michael Alt, the Midtown Association and Emily Bay Michaels to visit Sacramento and Mike Testa to all of our chambers, the Metro Chamber, the Black Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, the Asian Chamber, the Rainbow Chamber, the Latino Economic Council, GSAC, to our neighborhoods, to all of our business improvement districts and all of our city businesses for your incredible work and faith the times can and will get better. And thank you to the Central Labor Council, the Sac Sierra Building Trades, and all of the community-based organizations for having that same faith. The Downtown Partnership reports that more than two dozen new businesses have opened in our downtown since March of 2020. This was during a period when nearly all of our office buildings were empty as people worked from home. Amid so much pain and uncertainty, so many people were brave enough to remake their organizations or even themselves to continue thriving. Arts groups went online with virtual performances and exhibits. Gyms took their classes outdoors. The city proudly launched great plates with more than 40 restaurants staying in business by making meals for seniors, which were delivered by drivers from Paratransit, United Cerebral Palsy, and Lyft. We retrained 2,000 workers who lost their jobs. Teenagers became mental health mentors and offered virtual support to their peers through city-funded programs. The Fuel Network made sure that our undocumented neighbors were able to get vital assistance during a scary and an uncertain time. All these brave stories add up to an economy ready to take off, and we have pride here too, by the way. All of these stories point to an economy ready to take off as we emerge from the pandemic. The numbers support this larger narrative. More than 3,764 housing permits were issued in Sacramento during 2020, the highest number since 2006, before the Great Recession hit. A third of those will be affordable to people making less than $48,000 per year. Not enough, but we're getting there. And our metro population grew by 34,000 in 2020 as people mostly from the Bay Area opted for a better quality of life. COVID was not the only test of Sacramento's spirit this year. We saw quiet bravery in the way thousands of people picked up signs and marched to protest the murder of George Floyd and to demand that they be seen and heard that their lives be considered precious and worthy of protecting. The anger that people felt over such a gross injustice was righteous. Most people protested peacefully. Some did not. Many businesses suffered unacceptable damage. The Sacramento we know and love is defined not by the broken glass, but by the peaceful protesters and the hundreds of residents who came downtown early the next morning to clean up that glass.
Our police officers worked under extreme stress as the Capitol became a central gathering point for the national election insanity fomented by the loser of the presidential election. Say it the way it is. Thank you to our officers for helping keep the peace during a year when our nation's capital suffered a different fate. Now, saying thank you to our officers and insisting on real police reform may not please the Tuesday night callers from either side at the city council, but sometimes being brave means acknowledging and respecting multiple truths, even if it leaves the loudest voices unhappy. After George Floyd's murder, the city did not look for quick symbolic wins on police reform that would feel good to summon the community, anger others, all without making real change. Instead, we pursued systemic reforms that will make for an even more effective police force and save lives. We have a forward-thinking police chief. We created a new inspector general to independently review and report on serious use of force cases. We launched a new city department to begin shifting non-crime related calls from the police to social service responders. And last month, we passed one of the strongest limitations on deadly force in the country. Our work is far from complete. But I will tell you, it makes me proud that our city both respects and supports our officers and is not afraid to push for and embrace needed change. <laughs> Being brave means forging ahead even when you have a good reason to take a pause. When it would have been understandable in a pandemic to just slow down my colleagues and I were not afraid to continue redefining the role of city government. Five years ago, we had a tiny economic development office. Five years ago, the original 2012 Measure U directed most of the new tax revenue to traditional categories of public safety and basic services. Traditional public safety and basic services remain a core priority. But five years later, it is no longer our city's only core priority. Between the city's general fund, the 2018 Measure U expansion, and the federal CARES Act funding, Sacramento has invested almost $200 million over the past 32 months directly into the community for private sector job creation, for youth, for workforce training, for small business assistance, for the emerging creative economy, and affordable housing and homelessness. The city is changing. Our neighborhoods are demanding more resources and attention. Our government is responding. And as a city, we will not retreat. I wish that I could end the speech here. We could celebrate all that our city is becoming, all the great stories from this past year and feel better as we walk from this beautiful plaza. But that wouldn't be honest and it wouldn't be good enough for our work is far from finished. Too many people are hurting. What's wrong is visible before our very eyes. We must be brave and lean in, not look away. There is a growing feeling that too many parts of the city are not clean or safe. Our downtown still has too many boarded up buildings and vacant storefronts. The economic and racial divide is still too vast. The gang and gun violence epidemic has shattered too many lives. We have made affordable housing a core priority, but the need overwhelms the supply. And of course, nothing is more heartbreaking and frustrating than the seemingly endless tragedy of homelessness, untreated mental illness, and drug addiction. We cannot wish away any of these challenges. We must always choose to be the brave city
that our people deserve. None of these challenges are easy and none is greater than unsheltered homelessness, mental health and addiction. This challenge unfortunately dominates our agenda. It is a housing affordability crisis. It is also a clear failure of a still broken mental health system, a cause to which I have devoted my entire public career. It is the last degradation for thousands mired in deep poverty. And it is a profound failure of public policy, as I will explain in a moment. The problem has grown worse during the pandemic. We have not yet seen the results that we want to see, but I believe we have laid the right foundation. I know what you are thinking. We've heard it all before. You ran the first time for mayor on this. Is anything we are doing or planning really going to make a difference? So let's have an honest conversation about what we have done and what it will actually take to make the problem visibly and demonstrably better. The irony of the current situation is over that over the last is that over the last four and one half years, according to Sacramento Steps Forward, our collective efforts have helped, hear this number, 13,449 unsheltered people attain permanent housing. Thank you to everyone who has worked so hard, including Governor Newsom. I wanna thank him for his leadership and all of his support and the state legislature. Bridget Dean, Danielle Foster, our city staff, Lachelle Dozier and her staff at SHRA, the County of Sacramento, Lisa Bates and Sacramento Steps Forward and dedicated nonprofits like First Step Communities, Volunteers of America, City of Refuge, St. John's, Weave, and Hope Cooperative, and many others. Why then are the numbers so big now? For many reasons, housing affordability, failures of our criminal justice system, so many people living in terribly fragile conditions. People are becoming homeless faster than we can get people the help that they need. What do we do? For starters, we must prevent more people from losing their housing. Between, between the city and the county, we now have $100 million for rental assistance to slow down, I hope slow down, to stop the inflow of people becoming unsheltered. We have established a whole new city department to assertively reach out to people in the innumerable tent encampments, offering a path to stability and a roof to the thousands who want to begin changing their lives. We are opening the X Street Navigation Center in late summer, thanks to Vice Mayor Jay Chenier. That's another 100 beds on top of the MetaView Navigation Center. Thank you, Mai Vang, for your support. Four motels two safe ground camping and parking sites, thanks to the leadership of, of council member Katie Valenzuela and a tiny home community for unhoused youth. Thank you to Eric Guetta for pushing so hard for manufactured housing, appreciate it. Under the leadership of Jeff Harris, we have opened the Shore Center, which uses a cutting edge treatment approach for people addicted to that terrible drug, methamphetamine. And thanks to the consistent push from Angelique Ashby, we have funded and opened more shelter for homeless women and children. Thank you very much. In July, we will pass a comprehensive master siting plan to establish at least 5,000 new beds, roofs, and spaces, hopefully more. It's a big step. No other city has tried this. Once it is passed, no more fighting site by site by site. I wanna thank, yeah, that's worth an applause, by the way. I, 
because that's what holds us back and slows us down. I want to thank the Urban Land Institute for showing us that projects to help the most vulnerable people can be designed to enhance neighborhoods, not harm them. The city is not a mental health agency. It's not what we do. That's why our partnership with the County of Sacramento is so crucial to making a breakthrough. We need each other. The city will provide most of the sites for shelter, for safe ground, for tiny homes and for housing. That is the master plan. We need the county services so that people we house and, shel house and shelter stay housed and sheltered. Our collaboration with the county is already underway. We are working closely to find the best site for a comprehensive campus for the unsheltered people who are most chronically disabled. Let's pick that site together before the end of the year and let's get going. Helping people and insisting on a clean and safe city are not opposites. They must go together. I know many of our businesses and residents rightfully want immediate relief. And we will do all that we can to humanely achieve the clean and safe environment that you deserve. But the courts have made it abundantly clear that we have neither the legal nor the moral authority to move encampments unless and until we create enough roofs, beds, and spaces to offer those living in tents or RVs under the freeway, on Ahern, on the Parkway, on Commerce Circle, on Roseville Road, and in so many disparate corners of our city, a safe and dignified alternative. Let's be honest, just forcing people to move when they have nowhere to go only moves the problem around and makes their lives harder. So here is our commitment. I propose that the city put forward $75 million from a combination of American Rescue Plan money, the generous state budget, other federal sources, and our own Homeless Housing Trust Fund to carry out our Homeless Housing Master Plan. 75. I'll take a bid for 80, by the way. When we combine these unprecedented amounts of resources, a fully approved siting plan, and an even stronger partnership with the county, we will be able to help thousands and regulate where it is not appropriate to camp. And we will all begin to see and feel a difference. I'm an optimist, as you know. I don't expect to cure this problem, but I know that we can make it better. I have also come to realize that the real fault for the unending frustration is deeper than what we can do together in a snapshot of time. And that fault reflects a fundamental flaw in our public policy. It is time, it is far past time to address the root of this dysfunction rather than the symptoms. In our society, housing and caring for those who are sick is an option. It is not a requirement. Housing is an economic commodity. It is not a right. You can have it only if you can afford it or you are lucky enough to qualify for the limited number of supportive housing units. Caring for those who are gravely disabled is also a choice. It's not a legal obligation. But housing and mental health care are necessities, just like food. And in the United States, we generally frown on letting people starve. Name another area of major public concern where everything government does is optional. The responsibility to provide public education to children, the responsibility to replace fossil fuels with clean energy, the responsibility to help those with developmental disabilities, 
These are not optional. They are mandatory. We require that we care for the most vulnerable. I strongly support our new safe ground movement, again, led by Council Member Katie Valenzuela, to organize designated tent and tiny home encampments. It is our best short-term strategy to triage the thousands living in the numerous tent encampments and then regulate the places in our city where it is not appropriate to camp. But it should only be temporary. Today, I propose that our city be the first to enact both a legal right to safe shelter and housing and a parallel obligation for unsheltered people to accept that shelter and housing when it is offered. No city or state that I know of has paired such a right and obligation together. How you ask, will establishing a right to housing and shelter do anything to help all the people living on the streets with mental health and substance abuse issues? For many people who become homeless for economic reasons, and there are many, early intervention and a housing voucher or a temporary shelter will be all that it takes. For those who have been chronically unsheltered for so long, housing alone without services and intensive treatment most often will not succeed. The, the county took a big step last month by approving a program to mandate treatment for the most severely ill by opting into what's called Laura's Law. The city does not have the authority to create a right to treatment, but requiring ourselves to provide shelter and housing and requiring people to accept it when offered is the best proxy we have to get people the help so many so desperately need. Simply put, we cannot help people who are living with serious mental illness and substance abuse until they come indoors. We can't help people, thank you. We can't help people who are suffering when they are living under the freeway, it's common sense. This is more than semantics. For those who think such an audacious idea is ahead of its time, the time may already be here. In Los Angeles, federal judge David Carter has issued an order calling for the city to offer housing to everyone on Skid Row by October with staggered deadlines for women, men, and families, thousands of people. Judge Carter's order also documents the disproportionate way that homelessness afflicts people of color who historically have suffered massive economic and housing discrimination in Sacramento and every other American city. I would rather have Sacramento bravely lead than follow. Let's do it ourselves without a court order. Again, I don't expect perfection or a cure, but a legal requirement will change the mindset and expectations of our city and the region. For when something really matters in this society, we require it. A legal right to shelter and housing will push our city even harder to get more people off the street faster. A legal right to shelter and housing will clearly state our community policy that everyone should live indoors. Rights and obligations must go together. I do not believe that most unsheltered homeless people want to live outdoors. I also do not believe that living on the streets in squalor is a civil right. People who live unsheltered for lengthy periods of time live on average 25 years less than people who are safely housed. Our society has long grappled with the delicate balance between individual liberties and protecting people from endangering themselves or others. We are not going back to state hospitals, nor should we. But sometimes the pendulum swings too far. There is no liberty in dying alone on the street. Sometimes people are so ill that they cannot help themselves. 
a legal obligation to come indoors compared with a legal right to come indoors can be the difference between life and death. I refuse, the community refuses to accept the present reality. I will write and propose this law with my colleagues in a fair, achievable, and comprehensive way. It's all in in this city. We have no other choice. And so after that, I happily choose to not end my speech here. For there is also great joy and endless opportunities in this beautiful place we call Sacramento. I cannot wait for the year ahead. It's breakthrough time for big city initiatives. This is the year to complete the convention center expansion by finalizing an agreement for a new convention center hotel. Let's do it. And we are very, very close. Thank you, Angelo Sokopoulos, for being here today. This is the year, this is the year we break out in the rail yards. The $30 million we just got approved by the governor and the legislature, thank you again to the governor, will help build out all the needed infrastructure so that we can build even more housing, job centers, and entertainment venues for our expanded downtown. It will also help with something else. Setbacks be damned. We are within striking distance of an agreement with several potential investors to win our Major League Soccer franchise. Let's go, goal! Kevin Nagel, we're not giving up. We never give up, stay tuned. This is the year we're gonna open the SMUD Museum of Science and Curiosity. Let this iconic project be only the beginning of making the Sacramento River waterfront the gathering place for residents and visitors alike. Jeff Harris has been pushing something. This is the year we will get started on a real plan to make the River District into the next R Street, a warehouse district that comes alive as another great destination in our city. This is also the year we take our high wage jobs push to the next level. We will fulfill the eight-year-old promise made to the people of Natomas to welcome 3,000 high-wage jobs and the new California State Hospital and Medical School on the old King's Arena site. Thank you to North State and Dr. Chung. Thank you to the Sacramento Kings. And thank you especially to Angelique Ashby for your fierce determination to do right by your community. Thank you. Woo! We will also break ground on Aggie Square, the new UC Davis Innovation Campus on Stockton Boulevard next to Oak Park, Tahoe Park, and the Med Center neighborhoods. Thank you to Eric Gedda for your outstanding leadership. Thank you to Jay Chenier for your outstanding leadership. Thank you to Wexford and Chancellor May and our community for teaming up on our biggest economic development opportunity in years, over a billion dollars in new investment and thousands of new jobs. This year, we will get even closer to the 5,000 job commitment at Centene Angelique, our first Fortune 100 corporate headquarters, and that's another great boon for our city. This year, we will land more companies like HCL Technologies, the Indian tech giant looking to locate 663 new high-wage jobs in our city. Thank you to GSAC. This is, and Barry Broom, this is the year we continue to push more on housing especially affordable and workforce housing. It's controversial, but we will become one of the first cities in the state to allow well-designed quality fourplexes to be built in single-family neighborhoods. 
We need more housing. We need more housing types and affordable choices. We will continue to grow our housing trust fund. We will continue to innovate with modular and manufactured housing and stretch harder to meet the tremendous need. This is the year we continue to make climate a core city priority. By, yes, it may be more important than just about anything else. By building on last month's bold climate electrification ordinance to move even faster to clean our air and lower the unacceptable asthma rate for our kids. This is the year to continue making our kids the city's most important priority, Mr. Chenier. Let us place a permanent dedicated fund for youth and workforce trading on the 2022 ballot with a new source of revenue. So we're not fighting about how to divide the pie. Thank you, Jay. And thank you to Mai Vang and Rick Jennings for leading the charge. And let's invest in smart strategies to help curb the gun and gang violence that is wrecking too many families. Rick Jennings, thank you for your dedicated leadership on this crucial topic. Stops and starts, Chet Hewitt, thank you, all of you, for working together to make sure that we are making alleviating this crisis a top city priority. I appreciate you. We will dedicate another portion of our new federal relief dollars as well to our young people. This year, we will deepen our commitment to our core values by passing an ordinance requiring every major budget or policy decision to further the cause of equity and economic justice. We will bring forward an ordinance requiring future projects with substantial public dollars to include agreements for affordable housing, mandatory local hiring, and other benefits like the ones we crafted, Eric and Jay, with the community for Aggie Square. We will continue to speak out against hate or discrimination of any kind against our AAPI brothers and sisters. The same goes for any community, the LGBTQ community, the Muslim American community, the Latino community, all of our communities that are marginalized or attacked in any way. We will develop a funded reparation strategy with our African-American community to build more African-American entrepreneurship and home ownership. All of this, all of this and more is possible in part because we have more federal and state help than ever before. Again, thank you to Governor Newsom, our congressional and legislative delegations for fighting so hard for us. Sacramento is going to receive $112 million from the American Rescue Plan in our community. In a few weeks, I will propose a specific strategy for four vital, four vital categories. Revitalizing our business corridors, starting with the downtown, a fund for youth and gang intervention and workforce training, a fund for addressing homelessness, and a fund for shoring up essential city operations, including rewarding the dedication of our excellent city workforce. 2020 showed us what we could do with smart, focused investments. Our $89 million in federal CARES Act spending produced dramatic change all over our city. We've talked about most of the key investment categories I will propose for the new federal money. Let's finish this morning by talking about why investing in our small businesses and our historic business corridors is so important. Downtown and the historic corridors are at the heart of our changing city. They need and deserve our attention and resources. They are not asking for a major hand up, hand out, just a hand up to support their own smart investments across our city. Vice Mayor Chenier has spent the last six weeks leading an intensive effort with the business community to ask the key question. What is the most important thing for you 
to reclaim the momentum that we all felt before the world changed. It's not that complicated, our vice mayor heard over and over. Help us with a modest amount of resources to create a welcoming, clean, and safe environment, and we will do the rest. So let's say yes. Let's make alfresco dining permanent and remove all of the regulatory obstacles that could get in the way. Let's say yes. Let's pay directly, directly from the city relief funds to remove boarded up windows from downtown businesses and replace the glass. Let's make our storefronts look like storefronts again. Enough of the unsightly buildings. Let's use persuasion, prizes, whatever it takes to convince more state employees to return to their offices and shop and eat downtown. Our great city team is working with the downtown partnership on a program to reward people coming back to work with a chance to win big prizes. Seats at the Tower Bridge dinner, backstage passes to Aftershock, maybe coffee with the mayor, second prize, two coffees with the mayor. And that's just the beginning. Let's put our arts leaders like Faith McKinney, Liv Moe, Maria Acosta, and Shira Lane to work by letting them enliven more of the underutilized spaces in our city. And yes, we will also set aside American Rescue Plan funding to continue our investment in building the creative economy here in Sacramento. Let us close the streets and host so many festivals that it becomes hard to keep track of all the good and fun that is happening in this city every day and every week. The downtown and the midtown are our core, but so are our other historic commercial corridors. Councilmember Lilloe, a new council member who is working very hard on behalf of North Sacramento, joined here by the former North Sac council member, Rob Kurth. Councilmember Lilloe is working very hard to organize and remake Del Paso Boulevard and other parts of North Sacramento. We need to support him and the people of North Sacramento with millions, more than a couple million, millions of dollars for a focused economic development effort in North Sacramento. No part of our city, no part of our city gets left behind. Our ARP dollars must also support Jeff Harris's efforts on Northgate and Mai Vang and Rick Jennings' work on Mack Road and in Valley High. We must continue to elevate the strong start by Eric Gett and Jay Chenier on Stockton Boulevard. Go to Midtown or even downtown or any part of the city and eat on the weekends. And it is often a wait, sometimes a long wait. You know, that is a good thing because people are hanging out together again. People are out together in the parks. Farmers markets are full. We've just celebrated Juneteenth and pride with joyous events. People are smiling and laughing and just so thrilled to be out seeing each other again. People love Sacramento and they love Sacramento because it loves them back. So here is my challenge to you as your mayor. Don't let a moment pass this year without a full appreciation for what it means to be together again. Be tough on the issues, but go easy on the people. Help those who but for the grace of God there go I. 
Strive for more and better. If you haven't yet gotten vaccinated, please get vaccinated. <laughs> Love our city and all of our people. After this past year, there is nothing we cannot overcome together. Thank you very much, everybody. Did you go get the band up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.